Republican Representative Ed Brooks of Reedsburg has served 10 years in the assembly, and this is an exit interview because Mr. Brooks has decided he will not seek a sixth term. So, Ed, thanks very much for talking to us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I heard this wasn't so much a decision made by you as your physicians. Do you want to explain that? Yeah. Um, it was a decision. We were ready to run. We were counting envelopes to see for mailings and all that thing. But uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a year and a couple of weeks, we were diagnosed with leukemia. We spent a good deal of time in one of the finest hospitals in Madison last summer. And we thought we had our leukemia in remission. Uh, it kind of crept back on us. Our platelets were, and again, I don't want to get in the weeds too much, but our platelets were dropping. And so the doctor said, you may feel good, Ed, but I need science on my decision. So we did a biopsy and indeed there, there is a, a recurrence of leukemia, and because of that, uh, we feel good. I don't know how we look to your viewers, but we feel good. But again, there, I know the strain that goes into a long campaign, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't in the cards. And okay. so we're in palliative care, which is to manage the leukemia, mm -hmm. and uh, we feel good uh, and all that stuff. We plan to serve our constituents to the end, which would be January 1st, 2nd, or 3rd, whatever it is next year, but yeah. uh, it was a decision that uh, somebody helped us with. I understand. So. Well, first of all, I want to wish you the best medically. Thank Hope you. you're around for a long, long time. Well, so do I, really. Um, you, you have really enjoyed serving in the Assembly, haven't you, for 10 years? Yeah, absolutely. What, what's been the high points? Um, why, why have you considered it such a joy? I think any time you drive up to this building, and I come in from the east, up east Washington. It's just an awesome experience. And excuse me if I get misty, but this is sure. old, old men are allowed to do that, and so yes. are little kids. In between, you got to keep straight. But, <laughs> but no, it's a, truly an honor. I like my district. I, I would hope everybody likes their districts. But my district is very rural. It's a resilient district from the standpoint that um, government can't do everything, and volunteers step in to help people, whether it's. Grace, which is Greater Richland Area Cancer Elimination, or whether it's United Fund in Reesburg, or whether it's the Library Fund in New Lisbon. The community has stepped up to those, and that makes me proud. And I like to represent that kind of people. You've been on the town board since 79. Okay. You've been the uh, 50th district rep for 10 years. Let me ask you this. How has District 50 changed in the 10 years that you've represented the entire district? Well. It's changed from the standpoint that when we started out, uh, we were in a minority. Uh, the state was not in good shape. Uh, the state was having fiscal issues. We were getting stimulus money and still not able to make a move of it. Mm -hmm. uh, along came Governor Scott Walker, who is part of my brand. Uh, I support him in a lot of things. There are a few things where we differ. But we made some changes, and they were painful changes. They were divisive changes. But by and large, the district has gotten over that. There's still a few people out there that were uh, what they think perhaps disenfranchised. But again, that goes with the territory. I, I know at the time that Act 10 was being thought about. I, I could look out my window and I saw a neighbor who had just switched jobs. She was now a public health nurse. And she would have been the first to lose her job if we had not done Act 10. A little further up the road, there's a gentleman who worked at um, I think at the time, probably New Lisbon Correctional. Uh, I think he's since moved to Sand Ridge, which is still a state job. Uh, he may or may not have been safe. Uh, I looked at a teacher a little further. And all these things came into play when we did Act 10. It wasn't perfect, but it was what we needed at the time. I know the local communities, uh, there's a foundry there that said, okay, Steve, you're working for us, but we're gonna cut your wages 10%. You can take it or leave it. There was a professional firm in town and they said, we have to because the economy, we have to cut your wages 10%. There's an HVAC person who, who wanted to keep his employees insured. And so he reduced their hours to where they worked a minimum, but yet they could have health insurance. And so if you look at it in the total concept of the entire economy, not just public employees, and there were some things that were undesirable that were happening there as far as uh, not showing up for work, but then getting paid for double time, subsequent shifts and stuff. There were a lot of things that built into that decision. That was probably the most difficult one I had to make because, and again, I also have a daughter that's a teacher. But given the total package, it was the right thing to do at that right time. Dramatic, oh, dramatic as hell. Yeah, let's, but, let's talk about the emotion. Yeah. What do you remember about those hours, those days of debate, the huge capital rallies? Yeah. Did you ever feel threatened? Did you get calls at home like some 
Yeah, so that we, is, we, were, we were threatened at home, actually, uh, myself and now Senator Mark Klein. Uh, he was a rep at the time, both in Saw County. The sheriff increased patrol past our homes because our, our families were there. We were allowed, uh, not allowed, we were offered escorts to the hotel if we were staying over, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was unnerving. I never really totally felt unsafe, but it was unnerving because uh, I'm a country boy. I'm not used to people shaking their fingers and yelling obscenities at me. Well, that's my, not the way I do things. Was that the toughest vote you've cast in your 10 years, Representative? It probably was. And again, if you weigh all the facts on both sides, it was the right vote. And I think we're healing, we're getting better at it from that standpoint, but that had to be the most difficult. It, okay. Um, other, let, well, let's talk about accomplishments. What do you feel <laughs> you got done? I mean, you, you weren't one of these people that was up on every bill talking. You reserved the time when you talked. And generally, I've learned covering this building for a while that when people who don't often talk get up, people listen. So why did you choose on the floor to keep a relatively low profile? Well, I'm a man of few words. We'll get this half-hour interview done in 15 minutes, Steve. <laughs> No. That'll be fine. <laughs> um, what we did is we kind of focused on local issues. Uh, when I came in, uh, it was kind of the tail end of the Middle East Wars, uh, Desert Storm and all the subsequent ones. Uh, Volk Field, which there's a picture on the wall uh, yeah. in front of you, uh, was a major point of uh, deployment at that time. They'd come into Camp McCoy, get trained for the Middle East, and then they'd deploy out of Oak Field. There's some nasty bluffs around there. Yeah. And my predecessor in the assembly and the previous state senator tried to get a bill passed that would allow the sheriff to deputize military police to go off post, but at the time they had not achieved that. Okay. I was able to do that um, with the help of Senator Julie Lassa, who was a Democrat. A Democrat. Yes. You were able to work through that. Yeah. Okay. And so we got it to where Juneau County, which is a small rural county like most of mine, uh, they have so many deputies on duty, and if you have a deployment taking off at 3 in the morning, they may or may not have deputies available to patrol the exterior. And so this was, at that time, a significant thing for them. And so a local issue, if you will. So. Your first term, as you alluded to, Democrats were in control of the building. Yeah. Governor Doyle and Democrats running yes. both houses. Yes. What, did, what do you remember from your first term being in the minority? We voted red quite a bit. <laughs> And some, what about that? that? That speaks to the partisanship in the building, doesn't it? it? It does a little bit, but it also speaks to the agenda that they had. Uh, when they came out, and it wasn't a regular budget, it was a budget repair bill or something, so they could, they could not have a hearing, which we got criticized later on when we did have hearings, but they, it was essentially, uh, if not ran through, it was pushed through very aggressively on a very short timetable. Uh, they raised every imaginable tax fee created new things. We still fight with the police and fire protection, which has really got a cute ring to it, but it doesn't do anything directly to our local fire departments. It may end up in general aid and go back to them that way, but it doesn't meet the criteria that it says when it was in the bill. But, uh, and I think that gives credit to the people, to the voters, because there was a major shift next time. There was no redistricting at all. People just said, we don't like the direction we're going, we want to change direction, and they did. And from there, we switched over to the majority again. Uh, majority, you have to depend on the minority to be their conscience. That's the role of the minority? Yeah, to my way of thinking it is. I mean, they can be obstinate or they can be decent about it, but they, they are our conscience because they have to say, you've, you've gone too far, you're going too far. Don't scold us, just tell us the facts. And some tell us facts, others scold us. But When you came in then, after your party took control, you walked right into Act 10, yep. and then you passed concealed weapons, yep. and you've passed dozens of major, major changes. Yep. What, what of those major changes, we, we, we've talked about Act 10, mm -hmm. which of those changes do you think you played a pretty significant role in? Well, probably all of them from a bench standpoint. From a bench. Uh, when, I, when I was elected, I went to Robin Voss, said, Robin, you've got enough leaders. Uh, if you need support, I'll be that support for you. From the bench. Yep. So you saw your role? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been involved in town government, which is a total different scope. But uh, I've been involved in co-op, so I know leadership. But we have enough leaders here. We have probably 99 people, 98, exclude me, 98 that want to be leaders. Uh, we don't need that. We need some followers. We need some soldiers, if you will. Uh, concealed carry, that was kind of an iffy thing. Uh, I talked to one of my sheriffs. and. Again, maybe see this is the, the local government, me coming out. I talked mm -hmm. to sheriffs, I talked to DAs, and he said, in Juneau County, everybody's got six, seven guns already. It's not a big deal. 
at the testimony in the committee, Sheriff Clark, who was a Democrat, but I think they probably haven't decided what he is yet, but that's okay. Maybe he um, has. <laughs> yeah, that could be too, and I don't know where he is right now. But he said essentially, if you're in the north part of Milwaukee County, you better be able to protect yourself because by the time I get there, it's gonna to be too late. And that just kind of opened my eyes to say, okay, concealed carry, again, it's not constitutional. There are those that are further to the right that would say constitutional is the God-given right, and perhaps they're correct in that, but I think a good step was concealed carry with training, that sort of thing. And right to work and prevailing wage, pretty uh, divisive issues. It's were, divisive, but again. You, you were there on the bench for those? Excuse me for a minute. Yeah, I was, and again, uh, I'm a farmer, and so uh, unions, every time I get the questionnaire to fill out, I think, God, I remember three unions. Well, they're credit unions, so I guess that doesn't count. But uh, I understand the business side, and I talked to friends that maybe worked at GM when GM was going broke. I said, well, did the union break them? I said, the union really didn't break them. The work rules did. And I think if you own a business, you should have the right to dictate certain things. And again, uh, it, it worked out that uh, it wasn't the overall change. We made some changes in prevailing wage and right to work and stuff like that. But we're not all the way there. But from a local standpoint, a local official, Steve, when we would bid projects. Why shouldn't we bid with the local rate in mind? What did the people in Reesburg, what did the people in Boston, Richmond Center get paid? Why should we base that on some survey that came out of Madison, which is substantially higher than what our taxpayers are used to paying, but add that to the cost of public product? You described District 30 as rural. Talk to me about the unique problems, the major problems posed by rural schools that they have. Well, it's District 50. Uh, excuse me, I misspoke. No, no, you're, you're, you're forgiven 50. just once. Just once. It's really, District 50, there. Just I'll make refer up to it as the best. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> District 50, rural schools. Rural schools, um, they have a problem. Uh, we're working to eliminate it, uh, to make it better, I guess. To, we, we've put more money into rural schools than to all schools lately. And the reason we're having problems is our demographics are wrong, Steve. We're, we're losing people. And you're losing your best and brightest in some of these rural areas. Right, and to get them back. This is one of the reasons, maybe we'll talk a little later about the Rural Wisconsin Initiative, which yes. is designed to maybe neutralize the negative effects, the downward spiral, and again, invite people back. Uh, we've got programs in there that, if you want to teach in rural Wisconsin, you can come back and get loan forgiveness. Not an original thought, it was patterned after Milwaukee. They have issues getting teachers, just like we do in rural areas. Different issues, but they have issues. And this is one way to say, if you want to come to New Lisbon and teach there and go fishing in Castle Rock Lake, ride the bike trail to Elroy, we got things you can do. It's a quality of life. And by the way, we can get some loan forgiveness on your student debts. We can't pay what the Fox Valley is paying, for goodness sakes, but we, we have other things. And, so that's some of the stuff that we did in the rural initiative. Good, let's talk to me how much of that rural initiative got passed, what unfortunately didn't get passed. If you were coming back, you'd work on what? Well, one thing I've learned, and this, I'm more mature than you, uh, you're never gonna get the bucket empty. You keep putting more things in it. But there are a lot of things that got passed, but there's still more to do. Again, refining, um, the education aspect, broadband, we're making good progress on it. I mean, this is a, a two-term project that started towards the end of the last term and then this year a number of things got put in the budget. Yeah. Um, we're working on oh, apprenticeships for northern Wisconsin, stuff like that for when maybe a resident practices up there, he'll come back and continue to practice, serve his residency up there. Excuse yeah. me, here. That's just a drippy nose, it's not a motion. <laughs> yeah. <I'm just> <laughs> but uh, things like that are what we're looking at. Uh, the Rural Hospital Association works with us on some of this stuff. I mean, we, we involve stakeholders to find out what, what needs do you have? And this has been one of them. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, uh, the residency program is good in place, but let's expand that to OBGYN practices because if you're in our area, okay, we can come to Madison, go to La Crosse, Marshfield, Southeast, Southwest Wisconsin has some options, not quite as good, but you get in Northern Wisconsin in the rural areas, yeah. uh, a woman may have to travel several counties to get the specialized care that she needs. And this is one of the things we wanted to expand. I, I don't think we're there yet. It was proposed, I don't believe it passed yet. But. Does the amount of partisanship in this building bother you or is that just the way this democracy has to work? 
It bothers me a little bit, but it's not as bad as what the media says. Okay. Um, we can look at our tallies, and I think 94% uh, of the bills have some bi bipartisan support. Uh, we get along with Democrats. The first bill I passed, and actually the last one, were bipartisan. I, uh, you're from Madison. I teamed up with Lisa Subek, and we're polar opposites, but we're both decent people. And that bill did what? It passed. It allowed local... The brooks Subek bill did what? Subek brooks bill. We're <laughs> bipartisan here. <laughs> but it allowed local elected officials. And again, this is kind of a cyclical thing. Sometimes you have trouble getting election workers. And if you do, a local elected official could serve as a poll worker yeah. as long as they were not on the ballot that day. That's a good bill. We used to do that years ago, back in my youth. I mean, you just did it. Maybe it was legal. Maybe it was taken out. I don't know. But uh, it's now legal again. And again, Lisa and I, I, I like her. She remembered me when I was in the hospital. But again, we're, we're politically, we're polar opposites. Doesn't mean we're not decent people or try to be. Is there a rural-urban split? I don't really know how to answer that. I think it's, yeah. it, it probably is a rural-urban more than it is Democrat and Republican. I mean, I get along perhaps better with some of my more moderate Democrat friends in a rural area than some of my far right friends, say, in the, the band around Waukesha and that area. Just like I would think somebody, um, I've got a neighbor across the hall, Don Vuring, uh, first term, nice guy, pleasant guy. Uh, he probably has more in common with me than he said, perhaps does with somebody who's uh, from inside Milwaukee. Uh, we have different issues and it's not partisan, it's just rural urban. And that's where the Rural Wisconsin Initiative is important to kind of meld it together. Uh, one thing I've done, uh, uh, Adam Jarko did this a long time ago, and I think he went to Milwaukee and hosted uh, or visited with. I have to go slow because I always call him Gary. Evan. Evan Goyke. <laughs> Evan Goyke. And then Evan went up there. Well, I've done the same with Jill Billings. Jill, I, I looked at her profile because I have to look at the blue book to see what part of Monroe County I have, and then I'm looking up nearest, and Jill is there. But she was raised in Stewartsville, Minnesota, uh, urban all her life, represents Milwaukee or La Crosse. Uh, same number of people I have, but I've got 1,300 square miles, and she's got like 22. Huh. And just invited her to our house, uh, have dinner with my wife, went out to eat, but I also got to tour with her a hog facility, a grain, a grain loadout. She's on transportation committee. Uh, these are important things to rural, and we have to bridge that gap because uh, rural freight is important to us. Uh, it adds 10 cents a bushel to my grain, and that's real money especially if you're a bigger operator. Isn't there a rural-urban debate in highway funding when you hear that the zoo freeway could cost $1.3 and that I, uh, the interstate needs to be upgraded for Foxconn? Doesn't that, uh, don't, don't you find yourself asking, does that mean some of my state highway projects are going to be delayed? Well, it makes you nervous, absolutely. Now, the last budget, we did get more money for rural areas. Now, this is where I differ a little bit from the governor. Uh, are we borrowing for that ad No, we additional? didn't borrow any more. Uh, we borrowed almost as much, but a little bit less. But my concern is that the governor and uh, probably Secretary Ross uh, said we have to squeeze more moisture out of the sponge. And I've been farming long enough. There gets to a point where you can't get any more out. And there's where I would, I mean, not all my constituents agree, let me be honest about that, but the majority, a sizable majority agree that we do have to increase revenues. There's lots of reasons we have to do that because cars are more efficient and all that sort of thing, We've got hybrids and stuff, but I would entertain a, a modest increase in fuel tax. You would. Uh, I've been seal coating roads and wedging and stuff for 40 years or Is something it? like that. Yep. And I have to argue with one of my colleagues from Milwaukee who says there's no inflation in road building. Well, there is. Goodness sakes, yeah. We used to get a, a mile of seal coat for three thousand dollars or thirty five hundred. Now we're paying fifteen. Whoa! Yeah. Um, so. so how is it that there's this stalemate? There's there's this impasse on highway funding. Your caucus said we're willing to take some of these tough votes, maybe to increase taxes. You just talked about a gas tax increase. The Senate says, and the governor, no. What, what's the source of that impasse, sir? Well, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, uh, and again, I, I can only control Ed's vote. Uh, I can lobby to some of the senators. Uh, my senator, I think, I can't speak for him, but I think he's also understands that we have to grow the pot a little bit. We don't have to triple or double. I mean, every time you get into this, there's scare taxes. It's like, oh, they're gonna double it by 15 cents a gallon. No, 
But if we got back to in indexing, which I kind of favored back in my relative youth, <laughs> uh, we, we would be better off than we are now. And again, the, the political side says, oh no, we have to vote for every tax increase. I get that a little bit, but also we're all, we're here, we're delegated to do things. And uh, I could take that vote. And you had a people. chance when Senator Schultz announced he wasn't gonna run to run for the Senate. You passed on that, why? I like the district I'm in. You do, um, okay. Under the, some of the fun things we do, we do 140 parades over 10 years, and that's enough for me. I, <laughs> no, it, I, I like it because it's more local. Uh, I give credit to Howard, Senator Markline, because uh, he's a tenacious campaigner. He does a good job for those people in the, the bigger picture, but I, I like the, the where I'm at. You've been on the Town of Reedsburg board for 39 years. You've been chairman since, I think, 1985. Do I have this correct? You're pretty close. You're closer than I am because I have to look up in the blue book. <laughs> you, chair, you chair the Assembly Committee on Local Government. Yep. How do you feel? What's your response to those who say that some of these major policy decisions that your party has made here in the Capitol has eroded local control? Okay. Um, one of the things that I say, well, when we take control away from the county, like we did in Dane County, and give it to the town, have we eroded control? Sometimes, Steve, this gets to be little mis mismanagement of the facts or something. There are some things we can do. I know years before I was down here, there was an issue with the towns as far as permitting the spraying under power lines. Mm -hmm. and that's something as a town chairman I have no expertise in. I can figure out what to, how to manage crop, protect, crop protection products for corn and stuff like that, but I have no idea what kind of a defoliant you'd use to manage that. And that's really for somebody else. And sometimes these are things that do that. Um, we've taken away some control from the DNR. Uh, Representative Jarko on the other side of the wall uh, was good at that. And I support him because it just seems like you, if you have a pier on a river and it silts in, you ought to be able to clean it out one or two truckloads a year to get down to the natural boundary of the river. But yet that was blown so out of proportion like we're destroying the world. We really aren't. We're just maintaining it, allowing people to use their, their assets that they're paying taxes on. Now your district includes the bluffs, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Well, tell us about the future of the bluffs, given that whole history over the ordinance where, um, what, what was made there in World War II? Oh, okay, you're talking different bluff. Yeah, I thought we were talking about the bluffs up by Volk Field. I was talking Baraboo. Bluffs. Baraboo, okay, well, it's not my district. That's, that's not your okay. district? Okay. We, we drive down that every morning, and okay. it's awesome. What's gonna be the future of the Baraboo Bluffs in that ordinance area? Well, it's gonna be... Even though it's not in the 50th, there I got it right. That's okay, okay. that's okay. All right. um, it's probably gonna be some nature, some soft bird trail, stuff like that. There's a controversy now because it's five and a half miles. Mm -hmm. It's a big area. Big area. Yeah, but again, if you're a birder, I guess you don't want any noise five and a half miles away. But right now they're trying to divide up, and I think it's probably been ruled okay, but it's probably being challenged in court, which seems to be how we resolve things. Um, one is to have a long range sport rifle section, because you don't get many of those, and there are people that do that for sport. Mm -hmm. again, you have to understand that sport. Certainly birders don't understand that. Then there's also opportunity for some, oh, I don't know what they call them, dirt bike trails, stuff like that. But again, it's not gonna be- Off-road type vehicles? Off-road, yep. yep. That makes some noise, which is gonna disturb the birders. But again, I was old enough. I didn't pay a lot of attention because I wasn't that old. When this came into being, we had neighbors that moved up to Reesburg that were displaced. And instead of everybody fighting over this land, why not go back and look for the heirs of those people, give it back to them, or give them the first opportunity? But we never did that. I mean, it got to be a greed thing. Forage research is over at Merrimack. Uh, prepare to sack, whatever the address is, and they will get some land for their research, which is fine. Devil's Lake comes down from the north, some natural boundaries are there. Uh, it'll be properly utilized, but okay. uh, again, uh, let's, there's, there's enough there for everybody. Let's not just get so parochial because nobody really owns it. The, the federal government owns it and they're trusting us with it. Ho-Chunk, I think, is getting some back also. Okay. Yeah. You farmed your whole life? So far. What, um, <laughs> what advice do you give young people who say, I'm thinking about going into farming. Milk prices are down. Yep. It, so what advice do you give potential farmers right now? Develop a business plan. See if, if indeed you can make a cash flow. And there are different levels of entry. It's getting harder. I, I grant you that, Steve. The, the, uh, is it possible now for a young person in their 20s to have, be a farmer, have a family? 
and a quality of life? It depends on how you define quality of life. Okay. Uh, they aren't going to be able to afford hired hands, so they're going to be there 24-7. Okay. But again, a lot of people have gotten started because of uh, different approaches. They maybe work off the farm, uh, and they don't start out at 250 cows or something. Uh, there, there's opportunities, but right now it's marginalized, and it's very difficult. There's no easy answer. Um, if you came back, first bill you'd introduce next session would be what? Oh, I'd have to think about that and see what happened <laughs> over summer. Um, we, we've got some things we want to do, um, and some of them are probably a stretch. But I have seen enough battles with the DNR and agriculture. I personally would like to see some of the permitting process moved over to DATCAP. I had a farmer who had a chemical spill. DATCAP came out, they fined him $25,000, and they were done with it. He has been trying, he knew he was going to grow his operation to be a CAFO, which mm -hmm. is more than 800 Yes, animals. the largest farm. Yeah, and he knew he was going to grow there. So he's been in the process of trying to get that. He's done engineering studies, and the people at DNR say, well, we need a second study because sometimes farmers aren't really accurate on their first one, and that is really degrading to me because here's somebody who's putting six to twenty million dollars on the line. Whoa. Yeah, why would they do something that's going to jeopardize their future income and stuff? But that, that's the mindset we have. Six to $20 million? Excuse Depends me. on the size. That's, yeah. that's a lot of zero. It is, it is. And that's where you have to have a business plan. But you're not going to start out at that level. This has been a growth thing. But to, to get that over, uh, we've gotten so overzealous in our wetland regulations. We have people that, uh, there's a natural drainage and there's a field next to it and somebody went through in the winter, in the fall, when it was muddy, it made a rut, so it didn't drain. Next year it was a wet spring, and so it doesn't drain, so now it's a wetland because it's got some cattails growing. They can get it out of wetland, but it's a lot of extra hoops. It's unnecessary stuff. To me, government should be friendly. I mean, not buddies tell you what, what you have to do, mm -hmm. but not stand in your way. Do environmentalists overstate the threat of CAFOs to our environment, Representative? I think they do. I think with a qualifier, I think we have to put some science in here. There are wells that have probably been damaged, but we don't know the cause. Very likely it may have been a CAFO, but also it could have been their septic that failed. We, we don't go that far. It's automatically, if you're big, you're guilty. Hmm. And I, I don't like that aspect of it. Let's use some science and be particular. Just a couple more questions. Um, we have a very controversial president, a member of your party. Any thoughts on President Trump and how he's governed? You know, I'm not running again, but even if I were, I, I'd not be ashamed of him. Uh, I don't like some of his characteristics, but he is our president. Uh, the gentleman before him uh, was our president. I, I didn't vote for him, but I supported him because he was the president. I had hoped for better things. Uh, at least with President Trump, he's exciting. But he's done. If you, if you push away the tweeting and the rhetoric <clears throat> and all that stuff, mm -hmm. he's done what he said. He's, he's opened up some trade avenues for us. And as a farmer, we get nervous when we talk about trade partnerships. But we aren't, as a nation, necessarily good negotiators. And I think that's one of his strong suits. And no, I, I'm satisfied with him. Uh, again, tweeting and stuff, I, I'm not into that. Perhaps you are. But uh, it's kind of necessary. But yet, that's probably the only way he's going to get his message out. Because the media seems to, anything <coughs> he does is not decent. And so they're going to continue to push and probe and all that stuff and that sort of thing. But Final question. What advice would you give the next representative from District 50? Okay, spend as much time in the district as you can because that's where your electors are. Is that so, it? That's it, simply put, yeah. We, well, you thought, since you're a man of few words, we go only 15, we went 30. Republican Representative Ed Brooks, good luck in retirement and good Thank luck you. with your uh, health care issues. Appreciate that and congratulations on your promotion because you're kind of the sage of the Capitol Corps now. <laughs> when I came here, Dick Wheeler was here, but he's passed and so he would move up, I would imagine. And on that note, I want to thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks.